faith. Faith is the only key that will unlock the door of hopelessness. So listen again. Fear and hopelessness are gripping our nation, our people, even believers. Love is the only cure for fear, and faith is the only key that will unlock hopelessness. And today we need both. You have your Bibles with you? Turn to Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 1. Uh, we're in our series titled Hosanna, and now we come to the final message of this series called Herald. Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, These angels said to the women, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. In other words, what was happening was not something uh, out of chance, was not a, a random act. This was something Jesus had repeatedly promised them, preached to them, and now it had happened. Now listen to verse 8. And they remembered his words. They remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the leaven and to all the rest, which means they became heralds of the kingdom. Question for you, as we do every time before I pray and get into our message. This morning, right now, are you living in the grip of fear? Are you living in the grip of fear? Have you been plagued by hopelessness? Have you checked your love factor? Where are you with regards to love? Do you truly love God the way you should? Are you plugged into the truth about Jesus Christ? And do you know him? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? If you don't, right now you can know him and be saved. As beautiful as this place is, as wonderful as this opportunity is for us to be here, we're doing all this for one reason. So if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior right now, right where you are, you can pray and receive him and be saved. Would you pray a simple prayer that says, Jesus, I believe. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you were buried. I believe you rose again as promised. And today, I need you to come into my life, forgive me of my sins, and take over. I believe that you are the Son of God who died for me. And now I need you to be in my life as my Savior, but also as my King. I'll follow you the rest of my life as you help me. And Father, we pray this morning, help us. Help us not to miss the message today, the message that deals with fear and hopelessness. And we pray, God, today, let the love of God drown every fear from our hearts and help us, God, to become heralds of the resurrected King. For it's in his name we pray. Let everyone say, wherever you are, amen. Now, in order to truly understand how the disciples were feeling after the crucifixion of Jesus, we need to back up. We just read from Luke chapter 24. We need to back up to Luke chapter 23 and verse 44 because it's the context that helps us understand what was happening and how they were feeling. So here it is, Luke chapter 23 and verse 44. 
Now it was about the sixth hour. It means we're going back three days uh, to Friday when Jesus was crucified. He hung on that cross from about nine till six o'clock or, or, or uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. So we're talking about somewhere from 12 to 3, it says there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Can you picture that? A perfectly sunny day like this, but you're crucifying somebody on a hill called Calvary or Golgotha, and you hear the commotion, the crowd, something is happening, and they're dragging this man and two other criminals up this hill. They know this hill because this is where they crucify criminals. But this one is different. Uh, this one, it, it, there, there's a crowd that is following him. There are some who are shouting, crucify him. And then there are others who are in shock. They don't know what's really happening. And why is their savior, their, their master, who could heal the sick, bring the dead back to life, uh, he could feed 30,000 some people at one time. Why is he not doing something? If he is the Messiah, why is he not stopping all this and declaring himself to be the king of his people? And so this is happening. They crucify him. And then starting about noon until three, the whole earth is under darkness. I don't know exactly how that happened. Maybe the clouds rolled in. Maybe the sun uh, was blotted out. But there was darkness over the land. But something else happens. Then the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn in two. Can you imagine words getting out? Something's happening at the temple. There's also an earthquake, other gospels tell us. But something is happening. The temple veil has just split, and that was a very thick veil. I mean, there's commotion everywhere. Something crazy is going on. And then in verse 46, it says, When Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hand I commit my spirit. Which means this. Jesus was declaring that he was the Son of God. There was never any uh, there, there, there is no broken trinity. When we think about the Father, uh, uh, when Jesus said, My God, my God, why has you, have you forsaken me? We think that God turned his face away. No, no, it's not turning his face. Jesus was quoting Psalm 22. And he was fulfilling passages of Scripture. There was always the perfect unity between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Throughout the whole crucifixion. There is no broken trinity. And so this is being said. So this is, this is something incredible that is happening before them. Something bizarre, something mind-blowing. And then Jesus breathes his last. What was the reaction of the people? If you read Luke chapter 23, it tells us there was a Roman centurion who was standing by the cross. And the Roman centurion said, certainly this was a righteous man. I mean, even this pagan Gentile person could know something is not right with what we just did. What else happened? The whole crowd that was there began to beat their breasts and started leaving. There's a crowd of people. Some may have shouted, crucify him. Some may have been with Jesus from Galilee. But either way, they're seeing this thing happen. The clouds roll in, sun is darkened, and they realize, oh no, we just killed someone we were not supposed to kill. And they began to beat their breasts, which means they began to mourn. It's a sign of mourning, of grieving. Something else happened. There were people there who had followed Jesus. What was their reaction? Listen to this. But all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee. We only think about Jesus with 12 disciples. But usually he also had an entourage of women who supported the ministry financially and just in every way they could help Jesus preach the gospel. What were they doing? 
they stood at a distance watching these things. I can just imagine this is a perfect place to discuss that. Can you imagine somewhere uh, like, like that group standing over there? They're maintaining social distance. But uh, imagine that that's the group of women uh, who are standing there. And some men are there as well. Can you imagine their conversation? What is their conversation? Some of them are probably shell-shocked. They're seeing Jesus hanging on the cross. And they're going, I can't believe. I cannot believe this is happening. I cannot believe. Why is he not doing something? Why isn't he, why isn't he fighting back? Some of them were probably angry. I can imagine some of the younger men saying, I think we can take him. Those are hypocrites. They, they crucified him. They're scared of him because they know he's a better preacher than them. Some of them are angry. Some of them are probably afraid. I can imagine them discussing, do you think they'll come after us? Do you think we should keep going? We should leave. We should leave. I th- guys, I think we should leave. I can also imagine some of them just weeping the tears. Those hot tears kept rolling down their face as they're watching soldiers picking up their stuff. It's done. It's over. And this strange things are happening. There's an a earthquake, and, and the sky has turned dark, and the sun can't be seen. And people are saying that graves are opening up. Crazy things are happening. So as they're picking up all these things, there is that group standing in a distance. And I want you to think with me, what is their discussion? Their discussion is, who is going to get him down? He's hanging on the cross. Who's going to do it? I'm not doing it. Where's Peter? Oh, Peter is long gone. Last I saw him, I saw him weeping bitterly. I saw him crying in some alley. Where is James? Where is John? Where is Andrew? Where is the rest of them? I can't find them. And they're totally helpless seeing Jesus hanging on the cross. Guys, we can't leave him on that cross because Sabbath is about to begin, which means he's going to hang on that cross for the next three days. Can you imagine the vultures coming in? Can you imagine the body beginning to rot? No, we can't do that to him. And yet, listen, yet because of fear and hopelessness, they did nothing. They did nothing. Thank God for uh, two men. The Bible says they were wealthy. They were prominent. They were members of the Sanhedrin. One's name was Joseph of Arimathea, and the second one was Nicodemus. If you remember in John, Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. These two men had to come to the rescue of the disciples because they could not do anything. They were living in fear and hopelessness. And they pulled some strings, and they were able to get Jesus' body down. And Nicodemus, I mean, he probably emptied part of his bank account buying spices to anoint the the body of Jesus. They didn't embalm back then but just to anoint so the stench won't be there. Which means this, Jesus' disciples, that group that was standing in a distance, didn't even have the money to anoint the body of their master. I mean, this group was absolutely in fear and in shock. What did they do? Listen to this. After these two men pulled some strings, got the body of Jesus down, it says they took it, to a grave. This was Joseph's own grave. Joseph of Arimathea was a rich man who lived from another town, but in Jerusalem he was able to get a grave made for himself, right, in which no one had ever been laid. A rock, uh, a hand hewn grave. And then it says in verse 55, Luke 23, and the women who had come with him from Galilee. Followed after, I love this. So imagine these two men, Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, taking the body of Jesus. Maybe they got some of their servants to come help. Taking the body down. And and this group of women are following 
these two men taking the body of their Savior. Where are the men? I can tell you exactly what they're doing. They're in hiding. So ladies, wherever you are in the vehicles, listening online, you have more courage than we do sometimes, many times. It's just the women who are following. And what do they do? They were following after him, and they observed the tomb because they were not from, from Judea. They were not from Jerusalem. They didn't know how to get back to that grave. So they were taking notes. Hey, listen, we've got to turn down this way and go down this little path, and that's where the tomb is. Make sure we remember that. And they saw how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, but they couldn't do anything because it was a Sabbath day. The men were nowhere to be found. I want to say this, and I, I hope you take it well. Fear can be paralyzing. It's one thing to stand up and say, oh, we do this and we do that, and here we are, and where are we courage and all that. When time comes to stand up, many times we are nowhere to be found. And folks, that is happening in our nation today. We need to keep the law. We need to follow the guidelines. But when co time comes for service, let's not run from the battlefield. Because that makes us who we are as Christian. And fear is a choice weapon of the enemy. I would ask you to honk, but don't do that. How many of you agree right now that this weapon is being used in our nation in a very powerful way? Yes, it is. There's a real problem. There's a real crisis. We need to be aware of that. We need to protect ourselves. We need to protect our families. We need to make sure we follow the guidelines. Having said that, I have been in this nation for coming up almost 30 years. I have never seen anything like this. We're living in fear. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Listen, please listen. Open your ears. Listen, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Well, pastor, if persecution came, now that's when I will, you know, I mean, I, bless Jesus, I'll be out there. Folks, just keep in mind when churches are closing down, rest assured, persecution is not far away. Think about it. And this is not an indictment if people don't want to get out and protect themselves. We should, we should care about each other. But having said that, to just live in fear and to propagate that fear via social media, Satan loves it. He loves it. If we're truly honest, that's where many of us are. We're living in fear. So what happens? Listen to Luke chapter 24, verse 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they, we're talking about these same group of women who had followed Joseph and Nicodemus, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. Wow. Have you noticed something else in that statement? Zero men. Now, don't under, misunderstand me. This is not a beat down on men. What I'm saying to us today is, if we do not step up men and take the leadership that needs to be taken, they have to step up and fill the gap. Step up, take the leader. None of them came. What motivated them to do what they were doing early in the morning? It was their love for their master. It was their love for Jesus that enabled them to brave the authorities, to brave the religious leaders, uh, to brave any danger that was lurking in the countryside as they made their way into a graveyard. How many ladies would love to go out into a graveyard at 5 o'clock in the morning while it's still dark. I don't think there'll be many takers. And yet, what's happening here is that love 
is overcoming fear, just the way you would for your child. If your child was in trouble, if something bad was happening, you wouldn't say, well, you know, I'm scared of that. I, I'm scared of the water or I'm scared of the traffic. You would jump in. Why? Because love will overcome fear. If we're going to get out of this fear that we're living in, it's going to be incredible, passionate love for Jesus Christ and the gospel. And again, I repeat myself because it's easy to misunderstand this because we think, oh, wait a minute, you're talking about, uh, you're saying that this virus is not dangerous. You're saying that we just need to go out there and hug each other. Absolutely not. Follow the guidelines. Even when we're standing here, we're saying to each other, hey, maintain social distance. Let's maintain social distance. Don't be shaking hands. That's why we want you to keep your windows rolled up, not just so we don't get in trouble, because that's the right thing to do. This is not about pretending that this is not a real problem in our nation, but also living in fear says, let's hunker down, let's stop ministry. And then people bring out things like, well, you know, in the early church, they also did the same thing. No, they were willing to lay their lives down. Listen to what it says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. There is, listen, there is no fear in love. This is the Bible. Go home and check it. 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but listen, but perfect love casts out fear. The only vaccine, the only antidote to your fear right now, by the way, it doesn't have to do with this crisis, it doesn't have to do with what we're going through, but if you are a fearful person, you live constantly in fear and anxiety, listen, only perfect love will cast out that fear. If you're afraid about your past, will catch up with you. If you're afraid about what may happen, what could happen, what will happen, the only way that you will get past this is perfect love. And listen to this. Uh, John says, because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Now, here's the question. What exactly does John mean by that statement? Perfect love casts out fear. Don't miss this. This is very important. You have to read the context. Is this. If you truly love God, if you truly love God, you will fear God. If you truly love God, you will fear God. If you fear God, you will not fear anything else. It's because we have made monsters so big that, oh my goodness, this thing is going to kill us. Hey, listen, uh, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I don't want to get sick. I don't want anybody else to get sick. It's, it's very sad when we hear a news that someone died or the death rate has gone up or whatever, whatever. It's very, very sad. We pray for those families. Uh, we find ways to pray for and help our people who are on fr the front lines, the healthcare workers, the first responders. I mean, they are going in and dealing with this situation. So this is, this is a real issue. But are you afraid of dying? Well, I'm afraid if I die, what's going to happen to my family? What's going to happen to my children? Of course, we all are. But don't you believe that Jesus Christ is more powerful than death? Do you really believe that? Do you really believe that he is the resurrection and the life? Yes, we need to be careful. But does that mean we need to live under constant fear? Hey, listen, watch out who you're around because sometimes those are the people who will constantly breathe their fears, their insecurities into you. So you might be Bible-believing, a strong, courageous person, but if you're around that atmosphere long enough, you will start feeling fearful and anxious. But if God is where God needs to be in our lives, then everything else has its proper place. Are you living in fear? Perfect love casts out fear. Question yourself. Ask yourself today, right now, how much do you love God? How much is he the most important person in your life? Do you fear him? I fear God. I fear God. Not, not, I'm not terrified of God, but I fear him in the sense that I want to honor him. Look, look folks, if, if we were just 
afraid of this, uh, of um, sin in our lives, as much as we're afraid of this virus, what a difference that would make. We look at trash, we speak trash, we revel in trash. We're not afraid of that. And yet we're so afraid, watching, washing, careful. Hey, don't come near. Hey, what, put, put some gloves on, put the mask on. And all those things are wonderful. All those things are necessary. But if we were only that afraid of sin, because God hates sin, what a difference that would make. Now, time is running away. As we read in the opening, the women came to the tomb with spices in their hands. And they noticed that the stone had been rolled away. The body was missing. Two angels standing by them in shining garments. And they were afraid, right? Their, their, their hearts immediately reverted to fear. Oh, no, what's happening here? And they bowed their faces to the earth. But listen to what the angels said to the women. Luke 24, verse 5. We just read this. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and the third day rise again. What was their response? I, I love this. Verse 8, if, you're, if you have the bulletin open or, or, or the app open to the website of my blog and they remembered his words they remembered his words means they believed they believed and what did they do they didn't just believe they returned from the tomb and told these things to the leaven and to all the rest it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles, which means this. The moment they are confronted by the angels, why are you seeking the living among the dead? Immediately there is a transformation because they believe. Faith is not optional. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Again, the problem right now with us in our nation especially among believers, faith is at an all-time low. At an all-time low. These women believed, and they immediately became heralds of the resurrected king. Hope came in. Remember what I said in the opening? Hope, uh, 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 faith is the key that opens the door to hopelessness. If you don't believe, you're going to stay right where you are. Now, they go back and they tell the men, the disciples, what is their response? Listen to verse 11. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. They did not believe them. Picture those women running back. I don't think they just walked home taking their time, you know, picking up groceries. They ran back. And other Gospels tell us they ran back. And they tell these men sitting inside this room in a house or whatever they were at, and, and their response is, these women, they just, they just make up stuff. Idle talk. They did not believe them. The women believed, they did not believe. And I want to say this very clearly. If you have a faith problem, if right now, you can say it to me, you can say to everybody, oh, I believe, I'm, I'm man, I, we got to live by faith, we, we go by faith. But if you really don't have faith in your life that God's in control and that God will work all things together for good, even this situation that we're facing, the words of the Bible will feel like idle tales. I've caught myself doing that many times through this crisis. I had to question myself and say, do I really believe this? Do I really believe this stuff because the world is turning upside down? Do I really believe this? These men did not believe. 
And this is where many in America are right now. Many Christians are living in hopelessness. They were still willing to stay in hopelessness. But, 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 there's always a but. But one person had a different response. Who do you think that person was? I know you want to shout it out from where you are. Peter. But Peter. You know, in the past few days, if you read Luke's gospel, there have been a lot of but Peter. In Luke twenty two fifty four, 54, having arrested Jesus, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. Luke 25, 22, 56, And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him, but Peter denied him, saying, Woman, I do not know him. Remember Jesus had told him, Listen, you're going to deny me three times, and then the rooster will crow, right? That's strike one. But Peter. Not over yet. Luke 22, verse 58, and, and after a little while, while another saw him and said, you also are one of them. But Peter said, man, I'm not. I mean, these are all the wrong buts. I'm sure some of y'all have snickered just when I said that. All the wrong buts. But Peter and he's going downhill. But Peter going downhill. Strike two. Here comes strike three. Luke twenty two fifty nine. 59. Then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed him, saying, Surely this fellow also was, was with him, for he is a Galilean. Verse 60. Are you all ready? But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you're saying. Guess what happens? Immediately while he was still speaking, the words were still coming out of Peter's mouth. While he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter, which means this. He, he was somewhere near Jesus when this thing happened, this third strike happened, but Peter. Can you imagine that look? I don't think Jesus had a smirk on his face. But he had a look of grace with some assurance. Peter is going to be okay. I told you, don't come after me. This is not your fight. But you didn't listen. You came and you denied me three times. I didn't expect you to follow, but you made your way. And then it became, but Peter, but Peter, but Peter, Again and again. And listen to what it says. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. Can you, can you picture that scene? Can you picture that scene? Peter walks out of that courtyard and he finds a corner and he weeps. He's not just like a little, you know, sniffle. I mean, he is weeping. He is. He is so torn up. He weeps bitterly. Why is he weeping? Because he blew it. Like many of us have felt in the past month, man, we blew it. I didn't live up to what I claimed to be. I didn't live up to the courage I claimed to have or the faith I claimed to have. I blew it. And maybe he did not weep bitterly, but Peter did. And then he was not there to, to see Jesus uh, die from the cross. Maybe he did from way far away. Uh, but nonetheless, he wasn't there to take Jesus down from the cross. I mean, there's so many regrets, so many shames. I wasn't there. I wasn't there. I'm the leader. And I wasn't there. But now, these women come back to the house, and they say, he is alive. The tomb is empty. And we saw angels telling us that, that he told you this, that he will be risen 
after three days? And why are you seeking the living among the dead? The other men are like, women, y'all need to get some sleep. That's so dumb. Right now, I don't need that. But Peter. What did Peter do? Listen to this. I love this because this is love overcoming fear. This is faith unlocking the door to hope. But Peter arose. And he did not just take a stroll down to the garden. I come to the garden alone, right? We all love that song. I don't like it. Christianity is not meant for alone. What did he do? He ran to the tomb. He ran. You don't run unless you're expecting something to be there or not there. He ran to the tomb and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves. He knew. He knew right away hope came in because if he had sat there with the rest of them and said, well, you know, it don't happen. You know, I don't think it'll happen. I don't think it can happen. I don't, I don't think we can do that. He would not have been included in the gospel accounts. He would not have been the one who stood on the day of Pentecost and preached. He would not have been the one who wrote those epistles and the gospel of Mark. He would not have been the one that the church history talks about as the one who was crucified upside down. He said, I'm not worthy to die like Jesus. Flip this cross over. In that moment, he had a choice either to believe or to dismiss it. He believed and hope came in. It says he marveled to himself at what had happened. Marveled, which means what? He was like, man, I, I, I heard him say that, but I, I, I thought he was talking about some spiritual resurrection. No, he meant it. He's alive, which means this. I get to see him again, which means this. I get to apologize to him, which means this. I get to once again sit there and listen to him. And of course he did when Jesus came. And three times he asked that question, do you love me, Peter? Do you love me? Do you love me? Then lead my sheep, then feed my lambs. It means you are the leader. Let me close. Are you living in fear and hopelessness today? Because fear and hopelessness will keep you from becoming the herald of the gospel. You cannot preach the gospel. You cannot share the gospel. You cannot be a bold witness if fear and hopelessness reign in your heart. You can argue with me. You know, People argue with me, and I'm, I just don't answer back. I'm like, yeah, you're right. But if you allow fear and hopelessness to reign in your heart, listen, you cannot at the same time be bold about your faith. You cannot be bold about the gospel. And it's about people getting saved. As much as this is a great sight, we were talking about this. It's not about that. It's about seeing people get saved. And I'm not interested in just one or two. I want to see hundreds and thousands of people get saved. It sounds spiritual to say at least just one. I don't want just one. That's why Jesus did not say, hey, we're going to cast your net and catch that one fish. He said, "Catch, toss that net over. And when they pulled that net back in, they could not even haul it in because of the catch. It was so big. Every time Jesus was sending them a message, which is this, you will capture not just one or two, but multitudes with the gospel. And maybe we're living in that time right now where God is shaking the foundation of our nation, in fact, the whole world, so that we can once again win multitudes to the kingdom of God. But it cannot happen if you're still being ruled by fear. It cannot happen if you're still living under hopelessness. So what will release fear? Love. You have to love God. Love God with an intensity. Love God, which means you fear Him and Him alone. And faith. Faith. You know, every time we do services, it's not about just doing this service so we can look good on Facebook and 
Instagram and Twitter. That's great, but that doesn't last. We do this because we believe every time the gospel is preached, every time we, we do a live or whatever we're doing in these days, finding creative ways to get the gospel out every time that someone out there is getting saved, that God is working. We need to be careful. We need to follow the guidelines. But every time we, we find a, a way safely and creatively to share the gospel, our hope is someone out there is receiving Jesus Christ. This week, Rebecca and, 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 and some of the other folks, as you saw in the pictures, went out and, and handed out those Easter baskets. And they did it in a safe way. They had gloves on. They tried to keep social distance. People kept coming close. They're like, oh, you got to stay where you are. Why did they do that? So that some child will come to know Jesus Christ. That some family will see that there are people who care. And they'll come to church. Or they'll log in. We don't know how long we're going to be in this situation. But we need to find ways to share the gospel. Are you his herald? This morning, we'll have a time of invitation just quietly where you are. If fear and hopelessness are reigning in your heart, then you are here for a reason. And those who are watching us online are here for a reason. Coming here in a drive-in is, is not superior to those who are watching at home. Coming here does not mean that you have more courage than those at home. We don't make that distinction. That's, that's two very different things. There are people who do need to stay safe. They need to be careful. Uh, but the question is really, is fear, the overall fear of the unknown ruling your heart? Hopelessness, are we going to get past this? Is God doing something in the midst of this? If not, right where you are with Heads bowed, eyes closed. Confess. Do what Peter did. Confess to the Lord. Say, God, would you forgive? Would you forgive me? Not forgive me because I didn't get out there when we were told to stay in. That's, that's missing the point. Forgive me for not trusting you. Forgive me for not looking to you. I have watched far more media and social media right now than I have read your word. That's what we're talking about. If only the time that we have spent reading article after article, catching every breaking news, seeing every notification, if all that time had been spent into studying your word, praying, sharing the gospel, What a difference that would have made. Right where you are, confess that. And just know that He forgives you immediately. And then commit to following Him. Commit to obeying Him. Be like those women. Their fear conquered. Uh, their, their love conquered their fear. Be like Peter. In the face of hope, he believed. He did not stay like those disciples. He ran to the tomb and he marveled. He saw it. And if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you should be afraid. In times like this especially because you don't know where you're going. If something happens to you, where are you going to go? What's going to happen to you? But Jesus has conquered death. But even more, he has conquered life. Right where you are, would you pray a simple prayer that said, Jesus, I need you to come into my life. Forgive me of my sins and take over. I believe. I believe that you are God's son who died, buried, rose again. And I want to follow you the rest of my life. And I pray just like the sun is rising over us now the Son of God will rise in my heart. I want to live for Him. I want to obey Him. I want to follow Him. What will people say about me when this crisis is over? That's the question. What will they say about us? Will they say that you were no different than the rest of us? You also ran. Or will they say, no, 
they were ministering, they were sharing the gospel. They were trusting God. Father, we pray today, work in our midst. Let your Holy Spirit open our eyes to the truth of the Word of God in the person of Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray.